Important to note the GM was making all these puns to the players in real time as well. Eventually the party gets up. Two eggs. Up. Too exhausted to go back to town. Set up camp right then and there. The next morning, party awakes without their throat slit since Pete wasn't on watch. However, they notice Greg has vanished. Bedroll is empty and cold. Notice one of Rye's ropes tied to a tree. The whole time the party was running, Rye was firing his pistol into the air and screaming about how he was going to be the world's wealthiest rope merchant. Has a couple 300 plus meter ropes. One of them is tied around a tree and completely taut, stretching into the mass of eggs. You have got to be shitting me. Party manages to stop laughing long enough to try and pull up the rope. Well, Ryan J do. Pete sees his chance to strike. Lines up his shot and nails the rope perfectly, instantly severing it. Ryan J both fail their rolls to catch it and it begins slipping into the eggs. Greg, barely conscious, notices he's sinking further, begins to panic and desperately claw at the eggs, trying to climb out. Jay tackles Pete and ties him up fairly handily, since he's a slow and not at all melee oriented mage. Rai, meanwhile, has an idea. Grabs hold of the stump of rope left tied to the tree. This is technically in my inventory, right? By tying the rope around his waist and firing his pistol into the air, he's able to create a steadily extending diving line and wades into the eggs. The stench is unbearable. Greg is doing his best to tread egg and wait for rescue. By the time the party left the dungeon it was already early morning so he basically hasn't slept. About to die of exhaustion. Never mind the damn eggs. Rye closes in on Greg as he slips deeper into the eggs. Once again, Greg was a single botched roll away from death. Despite penalties, manages to just barely make his check to keep afloat. In the eggs. Rye reaches him and tugs on the rope, giving Jay the signal to keep pulling up. Jay is pulling up the rope while keeping watch on Pete. Nailing roll after roll. No jokes here. It was an incredible sight. Just as he nails the last roll to pull up Ryan and Greg, he crit fails a perception check and Pete slips away into the woods. Nothing to be done about it now. Greg, Jay, and Ry head off to go wash up in a river and head back into town. Pete, meanwhile, has beaten them to town. He's lost, scared, confused and betrayed. He trusted these people with his life and they turned out to be evil incarnate. Decides to go talk to his master, beg him for help and guidance. As soon as he walks into the wagon, his master freaks out. Can smell the curses on him from a mile away. Pete, my dear boy, what in the world has happened to you? Pete sits down, shaking and clearly traumatized. Relays how his party turned on him, how something in that castle changed them. No change him, how he can see their true nature now, how they're evil, so evil even he can't stand it, and he has to do something, and they're coming after him and tried to kill him and okay well technically he tried to kill them but it was basically self defense and, hyperventilating ensues. His master lays a fatherly hand on his shoulder and looks him in the eye, gods, my boy, you must get a hold of yourself my weapons. I'm so sorry. I never would have thought them capable of something like this. Listen to me, Pete, you've been cursed. Your sights are muddied and confused. Your companions are not evil, and you were right to trust them. After all, I sent you with them, and you've trusted me your whole life, have you not? Pete nods he has trusted him his whole life. Perfect, my boy. Now, let me see if I have anything that could possibly help you, Pete's master turns. Pete thinks he had trusted his master his entire life, but, did he truly not see the curse on him before or did he simply let it be there was the curse sapping his magical strength somehow was this all some ploy to feed off his magical potential or perhaps he had simply gotten in the way and his master had seen fit to dispose of him with the first band of brigands they encountered. Pete rises, speaks a single sentence. I trusted you. His master turns just in time for Pete to blow a fist sized hole in his chest and flee. Meanwhile, rest of party arrives in town looking for Pete. Get sidetracked by royal procession sent to hire mercenaries. Leader of the procession explains a foul cult has set up in the land and the king seeks powerful warriors to dispose of it. Leader of the procession is really into the sword, buys it for 4000 gold and change. Sees the sword as proof of their adventuring prowess. 
offers them more than enough money to live in luxury their entire lives if they complete this quest. After hearing their situation, agrees to a royal pardon as well. Main quest get. Party heads towards Pete's master's caravan to look for Pete. It's cordoned off. Push past the guards to see Pete's master dying on the ground, being barely kept alive by a villager with some first aid training. Upon seeing the party, he gestures them closer. With the last of his strength, he undoes a magical lock on a chest beside him, sits up and calls out hoarsely. Pete, he must be. You must air street. S. Stop him. Save him. With that, Pete's master falls back, dead. In the chest is upgraded versions of all their gear, with the same enchantment of course, as well as some scrolls. Party also finds a chest plate that rolls a random effect each time its wearer is struck, because why not? Party leaves in a solemn mood, decides to head to Gildedville after spending a day or two looking for Pete. Pete, who'd been spying on them this whole time, sets out for Gildedville immediately. Pete reaches Gilded Villa a few days ahead of the party, manages to even beat the royal procession after they got jumped on the side of the road. Steals one of their horses in the confusion and races off. When he reaches Gilded Villa, he heads towards the palace for a plea to the king, warns the king that his companions plan to assassinate him, and have already killed his mentor and nearly killed him for discovering their plot. King asks how they plan to do this. And Pete tells him they plan on using a cursed magical artifact of fabulous gilded sword. King thanks him, asks him to remain in the palace until such time as the sword arrives so Pete can be rewarded, punished, as needed. Pete agrees and gives the guards the slip as soon as he can. Pete wanders through the town, unsure of what to do next, and ends up in the temple quarter. Here's a divine voice call to him, the goody two shoes god, former god of Owen. Praises him for his sense of justice and commitment to purging evil, and offers him a deal. A paladin of his has fallen and become the avatar of a dark and forgotten god. This god needs an avatar of his own to combat the dark paladin, and he thinks Pete would make an excellent avatar. If he accepts, he needs simply visit his temple. Pete also sees a temple to the goddess of revenge. She's said to grant great power in exchange for a blood vow to end the lives of those who wronged you. Decisions. Decisions. Meanwhile, back in Onin, Rai is watching a fire and crying. It's just not the same it'll never be the same. Jay is wandering around calling out Pete's name. Greg is recovering from his third near-death experience in two days. Really wishing the tavern hadn't burnt down right about now. GM and party decide they've been through a lot and deserve to become level 2 peasants. Greg looks at his character sheet for the first time in a year and realizes he's been playing a fucking mage this entire time. Our cast of lunatic peasants. Rai, pyromaniac rogue who will spend the rest of his life remembering that one time he set metal on fire. J, acid bleeding heal attack damage dealer. Pete, former mage's apprentice and party member who went insane, killed his mentor, tried to kill the party, and vanished into the night. Greg. Crazy farmer with a death wish who recently discovered he was actually an amnesiac mage. Owen, fallen paladin of the goody two shoes god and official big bad evil guy. When we left off, Pete had killed his master and ran off into the woods, towards Gildedville. Arriving there, he warned the king that the party was trying to assassinate him with a cursed sword as a gift, and had already killed Pete's master for discovering their plot. King thanks Pete. Pete gives his guards the slip when they try to shelter him in the castle. Wanders into the town's religious district, hears goody two shoes god offer power in exchange for becoming his avatar to defeat Owen. Also his goddess of revenge offering him the power to kill his party. Decisions. Decisions. Rest of party, meanwhile, eventually decides finding Pete and Onin is a lost cause and heads north to Gildedville. Rest of party meaning Greg and Rai, you know. The lunatic and the idiot should be productive. Along the way, Greg stumbles and falls against a tree. Takes a small amount of damage which is enough to trigger his enchanted wild surge breastplate. GM says nothing seems to happen while laughing. Always a good sign. Eventually make it to a town along the way to Gildedville. Sun is setting. Party decides fuck it. Time is of the essence and presses onwards until they're back in the thick of the woods again and the sky is pitch black. Camps out till morning, thankfully no nasty encounters. 
The next morning, Greg volunteers to make breakfast. Fries up some eggs and bacon or whatever. As soon as he touches his fork to it, it screams. Just screams incoherently. Bacon is begging for its life. Eggs are aghast aghast. Greg stares in horror as his breakfast pleads for its life. Rye laughs and takes a bite of his bacon. All the rest of the food on his plate starts screaming in horror. Even promising not to eat it won't stop the screams. Greg and Rye decide they have to just eat it all so it stops screaming. It's horrific. Bacon gurgles and goes limp as soon as a bite is taken out of it. Eggs quivering in terror. By the end of it, Greg is visibly shaken and white as a sheet. Definitely has PTSD now if he didn't before. Rye doesn't care. All in all a successful breakfast. A short while later, the party arrives at town. Owen's cult has been busy while the party was wandering around doing stupid shit, properly entrenched. Owen basically controls half the city, party ambushed by cultists as they enter, but managed to fight them off. Rye rolls in effect, can no longer use rope. Perfect. Party enters the town proper, find themselves in the merchant area. Rye has an unpleasant look in his eye. His tiny, shrunken into his skull eye. GM remembers that they have infinite rope and Rai wanted to become a rope merchant. Fuck. Rai is not the kind of person to back down from a stupid joke. Uses rope and the pegs and fabric from a camping supply to set up a counter in the middle of the road by the entrance to the city. Meanwhile, Greg is scouting out nearby general stores to find the going rate on rope. 1.5 to 2 silver per meter. Rai massively undercuts them since he gets his rope for free. GM describes in long, slow detail as they sell rope. Couple customers come up, buy one or two meters. Some try to haggle, some don't. Most just walk away from the crazy guy with the fucked up face who's screaming about rope while shooting his gun in the air. After a few minutes pass GM realizes these two aren't going to get bored of this. Would happily spend 5 plus hours ripping rope merchants to fuck with the GM. Thankfully the town guard is absolutely aware that some people have set up an illegal stand and are creating a public disturbance by shooting at people. Heading in to investigate reports. Oh I you got a permit for this ropes governor. You go to mech and permit gov. Fackin no ao oh, I didn't think so did we ao oh, I didn't think so. Etc. Rye offers to sell them a lifetime supply of noose rope. You folks look like the kind who do a lot of hanging. Garda is actually kind of intrigued. I do do a lot of hanging. Guard B cuts down their stand and takes the rope. Searches them for further contraband. Guards are actually puppets of Owen. Plant incriminating culty things in Ryan Gregg's bags. Guard B leaves with Garda trailing behind. Asking him for the rope. This will not stand. Ryan immediately pursues the guards. Greg has had enough with the rope and goes ahead to the palace. The guards, meanwhile, are completely expecting Rai to follow them and lead him down an alley where they attack. Rai fires a shot at one of them. Rai will now explode like an atom bomb if when he is beheaded. Sure doesn't really do much damage. Guards are pretty beefy even without the evil cult shite. Fights them for a bit longer. Costa will save a known villain. GM laughs and tells Owen to do something suicidal. Costa's most valued possession is replaced with 100 gold. GM cheers as Greg and Rye check the effect table. 100% certain he's just making it up. But he was not. Oh justice. Thou art so very sweet. Rye's stupid rope extending gun vanishes in a puff of smoke and coins. Rye decides fuck this and passes a stealth roll to slip into the crowd. Heads to find someone to service his eye situation with the 4000 bucks he got from selling the sword to the king's procession in part 2, singing the Hakim optical jingle the whole way. Eventually comes across Hakim's optical services. Goes in. Hello my dear customer comes a thickly accented eastern voice. I am Hakim how may I service you optically what optical need of yours may I satisfy what the hell do you want I don't have all day. Owen knew about Rai's messed up eyes from his various culty spies. Dominated Hakim the other day. Rai pays him a few hundred gold and a few hundred more for same day service. Hakim sits him down in a large chair. Straps a device to Rai's face while his assistant holds up a sign at the other end of the room. Okay now my friend. Tell me which of these looks better to you. This one. Or this one. One. Or two. Who to own. 
or two, that one, or this one, three, or four, three, or four, etc. Eventually, a couple minutes after the joke stops being funny, Hakim kicks Rai out and gets to work. Comes out with a pair of enchanted lenses that completely fix his vision problem and make him look like a total weeb. Minus three charisma. Poron's request. They also curse him so that in a fight all of his allies look like enemies. Rai thanks Hakim and heads to the castle to meet up with Greg. Meanwhile, Pete has accepted the power of a god. But which one oh 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 suspense. Hot on the trail of Rai and Greg. Hears about a madman shooting and people and selling infinite rope. Knows it's his man. Arrives too late, however. And only sees the remains of their illegal rope stand. Figures the town guard is his next best bet. And goes to interrogate a cop. Meanwhile, in the palace. Greg arrives and is shown through to the throne room. Introduces himself as the king's newest mercenary, and asks if he's seen anyone matching Pete's description. King says yes, he has. He came here to warn him of an assassin. You. Suddenly, swords and spears are pressed to Greg's throat. The sword they sold to the king is wheeled into the throne room. Now that Greg remembers he's a mage, he can indeed sense evil magic on the thing. Shit. King flies into a rage. Orders his guards to have Greg dragged into the dungeon and to capture I. Greg desperately tries to plead his innocence. I can tell you how it's cursed. Oh, so you volunteer to bear the curse for me, then how kind. Guards are dragging Greg towards the cursed sword now. No 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 no. Suddenly, has an epiphany. He and Rai were selling the sword to the king's men when Pete's master was killed, so it couldn't have been them. King realizes that. Though Rai and Greg absolutely did sell him an artifact covered in evil energy, Pete was also lying to him. Decides to get the three of them together and sort the mess out. Tells Greg he will go to the dungeons to be interrogated and have his bag searched, then be held under guard while he waits for Rai and Pete. What if I don't want to do that? Then you'll be hung. Okay I go to the dungeon. Sits down in front of the chief interrogator. Surprisingly pleasant fellow. Makes small talk with Greg as he searches his bag. Suddenly he falls silent and pulls out a sheet covered in cryptic runes. Leaves the room for a moment and returns with dozens more. Orders from the local cult, written in a code that the town guard has recently cracked. These particular orders command Greg to assassinate the king. Greg is thrown in a jail cell before he even has time to protest and the town guard begin hunting for I. Not a very long hunt since he shows up at the palace pretty much right after. Brought down to the dungeons, where they find the same orders in his bag after laughing at his glasses. Thrown into the cell with Greg to await execution. Sitting in the cell, the party overhears a conversation. A band of magical inquisitors from the capital of the empire have arrived. Technically magic is illegal throughout the empire. And technically this area is under their jurisdiction, but out here in the boonies no one really gives a shit. At least, not until giant ice castles start erupting out of the earth. Band of anti-magic inquisitors have come to find out who's responsible and kill them all. Surely, this only means good things for the party. Meanwhile, Greg is dying. One of the first effects Greg rolled early on, that I forgot to mention because we pretty much all forgot about it is that he has to keep one pound of raw meat on him at all times. Doesn't specify what happens if he doesn't, he just has to have one pound of raw meat in his bag always. Unfortunately his bag was confiscated. Greg is lying on the cell floor in agony, going through meat withdrawal. A rat runs past his head, realizes what he must do, crushes the rat's head with his heel and pockets the corpse. Now that he's no longer writhing in pain, he turns to try to smooth talk the guard. Sure, the guy who just crushed a rat's head and then put its corpse in his pocket turns around and tries to convince the guard he's not an insane cultist. I'm sure he'll believe you. Greg gives up, goes back to moaning about he rolls nothing but bad effects and sucks, despite being the person who keeps rolling all the insane stuff that saves the party. Though to be fair half the party are demigods at this point. Speaking of, Rai still has the curse crown. For some reason, the guards were unable to take it from him. He feels whispers in his mind, power coursing up his arm, all urging him to put on the crown, telling him a god cannot be chained, and a god he will be, if he only puts on the crown. 
Even Rai is smart enough to know that shit's cursed af. Yo. But Rai also doesn't like being caged, and his usual trick of pyromania won't help him here. Rai is about 10 seconds away from making a very bad decision. Meanwhile, Pete has reached the prisons. Figured if Greg and Rai had an encounter with the guards this is probably where they'd end up. Is talking to the guard. Guard is also a puppet of Owen. Owen is talking to Pete through the guard. Can feel waves of holy energy flowing off of him. That son of a bitch stole my god. Pete has become the avatar of the goody two shoes god. Cleansed of his madness and the whole blindness thing. He realizes the party weren't evil and that he needs to make amends before he fights Owen. Pete has received a bevy of supportive powers. Complementary to Owen's destructive ones. Also gained a bunch of new spells. Including a temporary form of Owen's dominate and the ability to, once per day, instantly sway anyone to Pete's cause. Dominates the guard on duty for being obstinate. The poor sod's brain is now a battlefield between Owen's eldritch patron and Pete's magic. Pete manages to maintain enough control over him to make him confess that two people matching Ryan Gregg's descriptions were arrested and are awaiting execution for attempted assassination. Pete senses the culty energy coming off of the guard and asks him where his master is. Is? Owen snatches control back of the puppet guard. Guard looks Pete in the eyes. You're talking to him. Guard spits at Pete then falls over dead. Pete loots the key from his corpse and lets himself into the dungeon. Meanwhile, Rai has asked Greg to use his magical powers to try and cleanse the curse from the crown. Greg figures he's been a mage for like 3 whole days at this point so it should be pretty easy. Pours his magic into the crown to try and force whatever evil is in there out. GM rolls 6 random effects. All rats within 50 meters double in size. Suddenly, giant rats everywhere. Guard falls out of his chair as all the rats in the dungeon suddenly double in size. Next effect, the nearest fire suddenly leaps to life as a fire elemental. The fire in the nearby brazier comes to life, frying dozens of nearby rats in an instant. The guard bursts into flames as the elemental turns to the party. Next random effect, Caster is invisible to the 1d4 closest targets. Greg is now permanently invisible to the elemental, Rai, and two rats. Elemental turns to Rai, but senses a kindred spirit in him and leaves him alone, heads upstairs. Seconds later they hear screaming and smell smoke and the unmistakable stench of burning flesh. And still three more to go. Next random effect, Greg craves twigs after casting any spell. Next, Greg cannot be hurt by a sword unless that sword is already bloodstained. Last effect was lame and I forgot it. Rai figures that all that random shit was the evil leaving the crown and assumes Greg has ditched him, so he puts the crown on to try to escape while muttering about wizards. Shitty wizard. Rai instantly turns blue and grows another meter in height as his hair turns white. Gains an affinity for ice magic, the ability to cast a couple ice spells and control ice. Grows much stronger, physically. Also loses one int permanently as the mind within the crown grows one step closer to erasing his consciousness. Rai goes to rip open the bars, when suddenly, Pete arrives. Pete has assumed the party will be mad, and has decided to use blinding flash to incapacitate them first. Basically a flashbang spell, FB open up, kicks open the door and blinds the party. Party, meanwhile, has assumed Pete is hunting them down to kill them, and Pete has just kicked open the door and ostensibly attacked them. Greg casts blinding flash back out of spite, blinding Pete. Everyone is now blind, and Greg has a strong craving for twigs. Pete attempts to parley Greg and Rai. Greg and Rai tell him to fuck off as Greg continues blindly throwing spells toward his voice. Intensely craving twigs now, desperately searching the ground for them as his vision slowly comes back. Rai continues swearing at Pete, casts one of his fancy new ice spells at him as the new, est, voice in his head eggs him on to kill his friends. Greg settles for sucking on a wood chip as he finally actually listens to Pete. Pete swears up and down that he's reformed, explains he's the avatar of the goody two shoes god now, and that he wants to help. Doesn't actually apologize for anything, but asks the party to join him on his holy mission to kill Owen. Greg says they will if Pete can remove the curse from Rai's crown. Rai, yeah, what the floating voice said wait, what? Rai suddenly realizes he feels really good. 
curse PFT. Don't you dare touch my crown. Thankfully Greg is invisible and Pete is outside the cell so he can't really do anything but flail and yell since he used up his limited spells. Pete also surges his magic into the crown to force out the curse. Gets heavy bonuses since he uh, knows what he's doing and B is a demigod. Still a tough roll though. More random effects, baby. The nearest town will now be evacuated when Pete dies. Some random explosions and screaming come from above them. Well, some more random explosions and screaming. Greg spends the next few minutes trying to touch his right elbow with his right hand. After the explosion of magic subsides, Rai slowly shrinks back down to his normal size and Hugh keeps most of the beneficial effects, though his int is still stuck at 9. With the curse cleansed, the party begrudgingly reunites and heads upstairs to investigate the fire that Greg and Rai are definitely not responsible for. Eventually reach the throne room, where the king is hiding behind a dozen or so guards. Orders the party seized as soon as they walk in, not so fast. Pete uses his once a day sway spell, instantly converting the king to their side. King realizes the importance of Pete's mission to eliminate Owen and destroy the cult. Orders his guards to back down and swears they will have all the aid he can offer them. Though it'd be nice if they could help with this whole fire elemental thing first. Pretty please with a third degree burn on top. The half of the town that's not already a puppet of Owen is now sworn to the cult's eradication. By decree of the king, GM laughs as he realizes these idiots are going to start a civil war, or at least a religious genocide. Our cast. Rai, chaotic stupid wannabe rogue, again. Pete, homicidal village wizard, again. Dave, villager who doesn't do the RP gun. The three were kidnapped and cursed with the random effects and are chasing down the trio of drow responsible to get the curse lifted. Track him to a forest near a small, quaint village. Village under siege by orcs and goblins recently. Suspiciously recently. Party. Through a series of encounters. Absolutely destroys this forest. Introduce ogres to the ecosystem. Adding a new and ravenous apex predator. Turn half the forest to ash. Turn all the leaves in the other half to feathers. Dooming all the trees and plants to a slow death. A vengeful forest deity possesses a nearby adventurer and heads to kill the party. Party manages to roll luckily and purges the effect from her. Enter Chris, newest companion to the party, always eager for adventure. Party continues through the woods, manages to see through an illusion thanks to an effect Pete rolled and sees a giant dungeon in the middle of the woods. Orcs and goblins doing manual labor around a camp. One of the three drow is there too, keeping to the shade and obviously annoyed, barking orders at his minions. Party decides fuck it. Suns out guns out and attacks. Dispatches the orcs and goblins pretty quickly through lucky rolls but even with the sunlight the drow is dancing circles around them and wearing them down. Not looking good. Suddenly, Dave explodes outwards into a horrific, heaving, shuddering mass of eldritch flesh and tentacles. The drow and half the party are either paralyzed with fear or vomiting in disgust at the sight of him. Dave is standing there confused, wondering why everyone is freaking out. Rolled the effect caster appears to be a shub Nigirath. While the boss is weakened, the party wails on him while being careful not to look at Dave. Pete fires a shot, rolls the effect of a random female within X yards melts. There are two females nearby, Chris, and the next boss in the dungeon, GM solemnly hands dice to Chris. Rolls well, Pete just killed a boss that he didn't even know existed, GM is torn between laughing and being annoyed. I worked hard on that encounter damn it. Eventually, Dave's illusion dissipates and party heads into the dungeon. First fight they get into, Dave fires an effect that causes him to believe he is an old man. Like, pushing 100. Dave freaks out as much as someone his age can. He has a heart condition, you know. Not really fit for the whole adventuring life. Party watches in stunned silence as Dave does his best impression of an old man and shuffles back to town. I roll. Dave's player had to go and this seemed as good a reason as any. Decide to leave him be and press onwards. Arriving at the base of the dungeon, party finds a bunch of minions desperately throwing scrolls and chanting at a puddle of fleshy goop on top of an altar. Gross. Suddenly, one of the minions slits a wrist over the puddle of goop. Shit, it's working. Goop turns back into a very, 
very angry drow sorceress and attacks. Party engages in second boss fight of the day. Rai fires one of the first shots, rolls the effect all rock and earth within 10 kilometers is destroyed. Party is underground, GM decides not to rocks fall and just make it extend upwards. Party is now at the bottom of a hole that's a couple of kilometers deep. At the top of the hole is the forest and the village. Currently all falling into the hole. Shit shit shit. Drow sorceress conjures a portal and dives through it. Party barely follows as the forest they've ruined and the village they've terrorized falls into the bottom of a 10 kilometer pit. Dave was in the village. And that's the story of how Rai killed a party member who wasn't even playing. So, sadly, I've got some bad news. The guy kind of just stopped writing this story after this part. I know, it's a bit sad. But I thought it was really good, and I definitely want to try this out myself. It's a little shamey left it like that, but he hasn't wrote any more in a year, so I'm assuming he's probably forgotten about this whole thing. But, like, it doesn't mean it was, wasn't was worth doing, even if the ending doesn't, like, you know, get there. There's a pretty better point. I should have just ended it somewhere else. But I thought this was, like, and I wanted to give it to you guys, you know what I mean? But anyway, like, um, I really enjoy this one. Again, um, if you haven't checked it out before, try the Commoner's Curse. Links to that video, the table, all that other good stuff. You'll find that in the other videos in the description and all that. It is worth checking out. Um, I would love to hear from you guys if you do a Commoner's Curse uh, themed game. I am cannot wait to do it myself. So if you guys are wanting to do it, definitely let me know how things turned out. Because I think it sounds like so much fucking fun. But like, um, I don't want to keep you for too much longer. So like, boys, I hope you enjoyed. Check out links below. Subscribe if you enjoyed it and all that good shit. And I'll see you in a bit. Alright?